fallow infestation. Can recreational stalkers still cope with the population surge? Tim takes us to a new bit of ground with Hike's best-selling thermal spotter to assess the numbers. <laughs> shaking, shaking, got, got buck fever already. Oh. Zorro's Bedfordshire-based great-great-nephew is back, throwing his weight and his Gerber blades around his local woods. Yeah, ladder, fire brigade. Win a Yildiz steel sporter shotgun, 300 careful owners and 10,000 Dealey Hawk shells. But does it show it? Plus, Jaff Jefferson's On the Foxes and singing Meatloaf. More on that later in the show. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Have we got to the point where deer numbers in parts of the UK are overwhelming us? Are we now part of the problem and not the solution? For the moment, recreational stalkers such as Tim are the home guard, the dad's army if you like, but in a good way. Collectively, we manage the UK's deer for free, but there are only so many a single stalker can cope with. Thanks to Covid, the UK deer problem has supersized. Beautiful evening, Mr. Pilbeam. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous. So, uh, yeah, this is on a, a new property we've acquired because they've got far too much deer and they can't cope with it themselves. So, both Kai and myself have been asked to come along and see if we can lend a hand anyway. So, it's a small holding, 80 acres, but they're surrounded by woods. They're in the middle of the, um, lots and lots of huge woodland. And the first time we came here, we took, saw 250 deer, which is completely bonkers. So anyway, so we've we shot, I think we've taken about six off here so far. It's proven quite tricky because the way that the land is, it all, it all kind of goes downhill, but there's no backstop. There's, there's kind of woodland behind these, these uh, fields. So whenever we shoot, shooting downhill, I've got no backstop. And I've had quite a few kind of blanks because I just couldn't get a safe shot. Seen so many deer, but didn't get a safe shot. But that's, that's hunting for you. Four stalkers are now looking after this ground. It's a team effort. Remember, there's no I in Hunter, but there is in Tim and in Hike, which is what we're using tonight, alongside Tim's other bits and pieces. Now, before we go any further, a bit of admin. We want to make sure we pronounce this brand name properly. Just as the Finns call Seiko Sacco, Hike can be pronounced Hike or Hick, so you won't upset anyone. With that cleared up, let's talk Geeko. Sorry, Gecko. And while we are in acronym hell, there's always QUE. Going lead free again tonight? Yeah, lead free. We're using the uh, the Gecko Zero in 308 since 136 grain uh, bullet. So quite a uh, an aggressive bullet. The front part of the bullet actually fragments and the rear part of the bullet just drives through oh, the animal. I remember that one, yeah. It's so, a different box, it's throw me, that's a new box. Yeah, new boxes, they keep on changing the boxes anyway. So yeah, so quite a violent bullet, ideal for head and neck shots, but... It's, uh, it's where excitement starts, Tim. What do you mean? <laughs> Read the box. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. shaking, shaking, got, got buck fever already. Oh. This is the QE. Binocular holder, I just find it very, very good. I just tighten it up around my chest, and even though I'm crawling on my, on my chest, it holds everything there. So it's just one of those things I've actually kind of favour at the moment. Got a bit of, bit of dust here to check the wind anyway, so got a bolt on bit there as well. So, but no, it's just a bit of kit we tight, use. With your fanny packs as well. Oh, yeah, we've got, got that works here. So, in, in my fanny pack, as David called, I've got gloves, I've got protectors, I've got a bipod, my thermal sits in there, um, and I've got a head torch and I've got a rifle cleaner just in case things go wrong and some knives as well so it's all there out the way so if I'm crawling along it's actually it's not hindering my my maneuverability. How do you crawl? Just show me the crawl again. And there's that wiggle. That's <laughs> what I need to do is hopefully get up that high seat so if you look around there David it's about 10 foot in the air and we'll say I'll get up there and we have one slight problem is we've got David. We've got David to try and get it's myself right. and Dave, David up that high seat. So I think I need to have a bit of a think here because that ain't going to work. Right, I love it. <laughs> anyway, let's see what we can do. 
David manages to get up the high seat but clears the field. That was just a coincidence apparently. Time to explore the rest of the ground and discuss what's to be done with all these deer. So all these three fields here go down, it's very hard to shoot. Does this deer problem need to be dealt with professionally? So companies go in and just take these deer and some people in some estates are saying that recreational stalkers are not effective enough, quite controversial, but a lot of you know, recreational stalkers are taking a few for the pot and for their friends and everything else, and they're actually not getting the numbers, so therefore there's pressure on private individuals who've got companies who are professional deer stalkers to go out and get the numbers. So that may be a change in the future, which is a shame in some ways, because you know, I'm, a, I'm a recreational deer stalker, and I don't go out there to get lots of numbers, I just get my few, which keeps me happy and my friends happy and uh, that's the way it is. So it's a shame, but if you're a big estate and you are obtaining grants for preserving woodland and you've got deer pressure, there's no answer, you, you've got to get rid of the deer. Two years of COVID, meat prices are on the floor as well. So, you know, it's not happening really, is it? Which is a shame. Don't move, David. Tim has only had the Hike Microlynx Pro LH19 for a couple of days. The reason Hike sent him this one is because it's the Thermal Optics Company's best seller, possibly because the price is something people can justify. The beauty of this is actually it's so small and it's ergonomically brilliant. Four fingers, four controls, and I can flick in between the three. Are like you playing a flute? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. Simple as that. And uh, I'm on record still, which is quite nice. Um, it just seems to be very easy and also it's very, 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 very easy on the eye. Now I like the one zoom because the field of view is so wide. So it allows me to scan a bigger area, especially in the woodland, which is rather good. So, you know, for a entry level thermal, at the moment I'm quite impressed with it really. You know, it hasn't got all the bells and whistles, but actually, as I keep saying to people, what you really need, you know, you can spot a deer out to maybe about 850 metres. Well, that's plenty far enough, for goodness sake. And that was so that this deer I'm looking at at the moment is 100 metres away. You know, that's pretty clear. So what more do you want out of your thermal? You know, and it's so easy to just pop it in your pocket when you don't use it. How much is it? And I think it's around about £1,200 retail, so... Yeah, it's just a really quite... Prices are coming down, aren't they? Yeah, the price of these thermals, as we know, coming down, and the, and the processes and these hikes are, you know, they are, you know, what people don't understand is that actually um, they, the processing and the sensitivity of the, the sensors is actually equivalent to other brands, which are a lot more expensive. So, you know, these guys have really got it together. So, yeah, at the moment, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to use put it that way and uh, so it's a shame we can't see any more deer at the moment. <laughs> to add insult to injury the neighbouring field is covered in deer. We are out of light and luck. The amount of times you go out and you draw a blank is it just shows you how hard deer stalking is and that's why perhaps landowners and the natural England are getting a bit frustrated because you know we're not effective enough perhaps so uh, and I think, you know, that's, 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 that's and also I think what, um, what Kai and I tend to do as well is we work together, so therefore we won't actually stalk together. We kind of, we move around and we just move deer around and we find that's probably the most effective way of actually managing deer and just push them around a bit nice and steadily and we communicate on the phone, whatever, and uh, that's probably our, our best way of getting, guaranteeing to get some more uh, beasts on the ground. To find out more about the Hick or Hike Optics range, go to eliteoptical.co.uk. Thank you, Tim. Someone needs to come up with a portable backstop. Tim was also front and centre in last week's field tester show where we discussed the possible demise of the 2-2 rimfire. Plus, we published the results of our steel versus barrels challenge. Thank you to every one of the hundreds of clay shots who helped put 10,000 Ely Eco Wad shells down the barrels of a standard Yildiz steel sporter shotgun. And there were a few thousand game loads in there too. We want to find out if steel causes streaky barrels. This is what our independent gunsmith, Mark from Roland Watson, has to say. The, the blacking was good, the finish on the action was good, and there was no wear at all. And a thorough clean, 
you could quite easily have put the gun up back up for sale as new and you wouldn't have known, you would have been none the wiser. That's how little it wore. So good as new, eh? Well, good job as we're giving away that highly capable yield is once worth £899 to one lucky Field Sports Extra viewer. And how do you watch Field Sports Extra, our behind the scenes show that goes out on Tuesday nights? You become a Field Sports Nation member. If you're not signed up as a member, please click on the link in the description below and get your name in the hat for a shotgun. Good luck. And if you haven't watched Field Tester, you'll see the full report from Mark plus lots, lots more. Next, from shiny barrels to damaged goods, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. So, what's the score if you're travelling from the UK to Europe with a firearm this year? Well, it's not as complicated as Brexit first made it look. Research by the SCI's UK chapter reveals that most European countries only require you to have a visitor's licence for the country where you plan to hunt, such as the German Jagdschein, plus a valid UK gun licence. The UK government rules that a UK gun licence can also work as an export and import permit. There are exceptions, such as the Netherlands customs officials who enforce tougher rules. We sort of muddled through it and found out was that, that things weren't quite as they seemed. So the French made an announcement a few weeks ago, a week ago or so, saying that you could travel with a Category C gun, or two Category C guns. Category C is a sporty long gun. A long gun, a sporty rifle, a sporty shotgun, and 100 rounds of ammunition. Scotland's new green-tinted government is planning to end grouse shooting. The SNP's new coalition with the Green Party plans to crack down on grouse shooting. They plan to license grouse moors for shooting, look at Muirburn and wildlife crime. There is a proposal that the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals should be given special powers to investigate wildlife crime and suggest changes in laws covering grouse and other wildlife management. The new Green Manifesto also applauds the reintroduction of beavers, which has been unpopular with farmers and fishermen and has been so successful they're now being culled. Basque is urging shooters to respond to a new consultation on general licences in Wales. Natural Resources Wales is considering removing magpies from general licences, citing evidence of species decline. Magpies are generally considered pests that prey on songbirds. NRW's 87-page consultation is part of a wider wild bird review. Basque Wales says it will scrutinise the consultation and ensure members are kept up to date throughout. It ends on the 11th of November. Antis are telling people on the moors that they're working for the police, according to the National Gamekeepers Organisation. That's one of the range of allegations that the NGO makes in a letter to Yorkshire Police. The NGO complains the self-proclaimed Moorland monitors disrupt shoots, abuse staff and persecute gamekeepers by exposing their names and addresses online. The NGO also points to criminal damage to property on shooting estates, well documented by Field Sports News. The police refused to comment on the claims when asked by the Telegraph newspaper. Thanks to viewer Max for the tip. Is the League Against Cruel Sports brainwashing children with anti-shooting propaganda? Yes, it is, and the teachers across the UK are helping. Lax tweeted last week it's about to launch a programme to educate and inspire children on its League of Animals website. It's chock full of modules for teachers to download so they can tell children that hunting is bad and killing animals is cruel. Concerned parents can be assured it's completely biased. Currently, there are 30 free to download lesson plans. In one called League of Animals, teachers are asked to get children to think of ways to raise awareness of Lax's mission to protect animals and the evils of hunting and shooting. BBC TV presenter Chris Packham is getting stressed out by comments about him on social media. Packham and his co-presenter Megan McCubbin, the daughter of Packham's girlfriend, say they are troubled by online trolls in a Daily Mirror plug for their new TV series. 
Packham calls on social media firms to make users accountable for their words, accusing trolls of doing an enormous amount of damage. The BBC naturalist himself routinely posts messages online criticising farmers, hunters and shooters, or accusing gamekeepers of killing birds of prey without backing his claims with facts, adding to the persecution of moorland managers. Two guns that Queen Victoria gave to Prince Albert are up for auction. The pair of 14-bore percussion guns, signed by the recently relaunched firm of Charles Lancaster, have nickel silver fittings, platinum-lined breeches and plugs, and come with ebony ramrods. Hammers and locks have fine scroll engraving, and trigger guards feature dogs and game. The maker confirms the guns were built in 1850. Albert was a regular customer of Charles Lancaster. Gavin Gardner's auction is on the 6th of September, 2021. Generally every three or four months, these auctioneers, including Gavin, come up with 200 or more guns, you know, lots of nice side locks, lots of pairs, lots of interesting bits and pieces, and they must work so hard to get this stuff in every sale. And you never see them, or very rarely, uh, see them cancel the sale because they haven't got enough stuff in. YouTube has banned one of its biggest air gun channels. YouTube deleted replica guns after claims the company was selling counterfeit products. The owners say they have been selling products from companies including ASG, Cybergun and Zigzauer legally for years. YouTube told the company it will never be able to set up another channel. The owners expect other air gun channels to be targeted next. YouTube cracked down on these type of channels in 2018 in what looked like an accidental move, banning several of them and then reinstating them. Deer in the US are carrying coronavirus, according to researchers. White-tailed deer in New York and Pennsylvania were tested and found to be carrying the virus. It's not clear whether it was passed on to deer by humans, other animals or the environment. There are about 30 million whitetails in the US. The researchers say hunters should not be worried about eating meat from infected deer, as there's no evidence the virus can be caught through ingestion. Antis are targeting US hunters and game dealers with a petition calling for a ban on meat transport. The Centre for Biological Diversity and the Natural Resources Defence Council are, cause, are using fear of another pandemic to push their anti-hunting agenda with a petition to ban wild game, including venison, feathers, hides, antlers and even stuffed trophies from crossing state lines. However, the petitioners admit hunting funds conservation. US pressure group Sportsman's Alliance say the petition will dismantle and destroy 100 years of conservation, including the wildlife the two groups claim they want to protect whilst crippling rural Africa. America's latest sanctions on Russia include a ban on the importation of guns and ammunition. The State Department move includes sporting goods such as Baikal shotguns and means fewer bullets for American gun owners during the USA's ammunition drought. Critics say the move does not equate to gun control and will not stop crime, only drive up ammo prices and drive up costs for related businesses. And finally, Britain's biggest rod caught freshwater fish is not a record because of a rule change. Tipping the scales at 101 pounds, Goliath the catfish has piled on 39 pounds since it was caught in the Withy Pool in Bedfordshire in 1997. Since then, the British Record Fish Committee has changed its rules to exclude catfish. The man who caught the fish, Steve Stewart, says that missing out on the record is frustrating. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. A quick shout out now to the Doyle family, Jason and Carly, regulars on our show, who have just produced this Ruby Rose Doyle, and they have found how to make her sleep. You may add your own witticism in the comments below. Next up, it's flashing steel. If you are in the woods of Bedfordshire, look out for the mark of Childerley. Here's one of the pheasant release pens, and uh, we've got some overhanging trees, which don't look a problem because it gives it a nice bit of shelter, but the trouble is the poults are on the inside, and what happens is they've got all this lovely roosting on the inside, 
and they get to this open area here in the evening and they want to fly up into these trees on the edge. And then what happens is they miss because they're young poults. They land out here, walk into the bush and the fox comes along and kills them. But quick and easy, we're going to do it with a Gerber saw. It's a, basically a wood saw, nice and easy to use. Cracking handle, nice good grip, nice and lightweight. And it comes with a changeable blade. So in the back of this pouch, we've got different blades. I always wondered about that. So the teeth size. Yeah. Explain the teeth size, because no one's ever told me. Ah, so basically you get the difference between a, um, a tenon saw or, and a coping saw compared to a, um, a ripping saw, like a big wood saw. So like your normal carpentry saw, the bigger one, it's got a lot bigger teeth. So this can go through wood with moisture in it, whether it's sap or wet wood. So it'll rip through. It won't do a very pretty cut, but it'll get the job done. Whereas a finer tooth cut will go through better for drier wood um, and it'll do a nice smooth cut. You had to do a nice finish now? No, effective and easy. <laughs> so I'll be up the tree. Okay. Right, I'm just going to go up there. I mean, don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah, so basically up here, safety is the most important thing. So when you're doing this sort of work, you make sure you have somebody else with you. Obviously your first aid kit and everything else, but um, yeah, be sensible and work to your own limits, really your own height, comfort and um, where you're happy to fall from, basically. I'm not really. Don't you worry, I'm not falling anywhere. I'm scared of heights. Underneath the branch to start with, to give you like maximum leverage when it starts to fall, and it should break away and uh, fall away. So a great thing with this, once you finish doing the cutting, you put it away, put it back in its in its uh, pouch. So we're gonna maneuver up to the next bit of tree. Go yeah, you got a ladder, fire brigade, <laughs> the cut up a tree. Thanks, Paul. Now we're off to Somerset where Jeff Jefferson of the South Somerset Ferreters has rifle and night vision at the ready for August foxes. Go down to the gate, Com. Go down to the gate. Come on. The local gamekeeper on a neighbouring estate's just got all these pheasants in. Um, and I do a lot of shooting around the area. So I'm uh, out on a neighbouring, couple of neighbouring farms just trying to help him out keep the foxes down to stop him getting his pheasants, you know. I mean, I have been out lamping foxes for ooh, two or three months now. Um, no reason, I just haven't had a chance to get out, so I'm sure there'll be a few around tonight. There's been grass cut, um, no wheat's been cut yet around here because of the weather, so that's, they've held off on cutting the wheat. So we're a little bit limited where we can go, but we can, we can go a few places, so let's hope we can uh, see a few foxes. You kind of get an idea of where the foxes are. Um, this, this field we're stood in now, we normally see one in here. The last time we came out, we shot a fox in this field. So. It'd be nice to get a couple, two or three. Yeah, just to help the gamekeeper out more than anything. I mean, that's mainly why we're out tonight, to protect these pheasants, you know. Jaff's technique is to scan with the lamp, then switch to night vision. Thanks for giving out rabbit in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs> Jaff's brother, Paul, who is driving, is able to watch the action live on an iPad in the cab. Okay. Turn your lights off, I'll guide you with a torch. I think it's a fox. There's a cow in there, am I? Just stop at the gate, I'll have a look over. It might be a cow. I think I missed it. Oh dear, a miss. Paul will not let Jaff forget that. 
Yeah. What, the one that he missed? Yeah. I won't mention the one he missed ever again. See you later. Never again. <laughs> Back on their rounds, Jaff finds another fox and it's a chance to redeem himself. I think we're, there's about a slight little two second delay, look like it. Straight in front of us, is he? I'd say he's got it with the fud. There's a nice big dog fox, look. There was two, there was one behind, walking up and down the hedge, but he wouldn't look at the light. But there was three foxes here somewhere. Yeah, so that's a good result. It's big as well. Paul and Jaff have a good working relationship that goes back to childhood. He, like I say, it gives me a little um, shake of a light which way he wants me to go, and we've never actually talked about it. We just know what the signs mean, you know, so. Like that, like that. See a little twitch of the little twitch of the torch and I just go over there. Next we hit the fox mother load. We saw a fox down there, he went through the hedge while I was squeaking. One come up behind us and one come up to the right of us through the gateway here as well. So if we go through this gate, I'll open it up. Yeah, we lost the screen in case we can yeah, see we what's park. going on. If we park up in there, another squeak. Okay. I'll reverse that part. I'll reverse up five foot because he opens this way. Okay. When we were squeaking over there, one appeared behind us. Yeah? Yeah. Because one went through the hedge there, didn't it? See. Whether the one that went through the hedge was this one, yeah. but while we were squeaking, be. one crept up behind us. So there's three here somewhere, unless yeah, that's the same. When you told me to turn the vehicle round, yeah. and then you said there's one behind us, I thought, oh God. Well, I couldn't shoot behind, I've got nothing to rest on. No. no, I'm happy with the result, two foxes. The gamekeeper, he texted me earlier, he had four last night as himself, so that's six gone now so and you saw other foxes around yeah plenty um we probably saw five or six so they're here um i think a lot of them are young ones but that that dog fox we shot he's uh he's a slightly older one because he he knew something was up and he wouldn't stick his head up above the grass so uh eventually he did stick his head up and that was his misfortune like you know but good result great night really off the one we missed. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> and today I learned that Jeff's missing again. This time he's lying in bed complaining he has COVID. So get well soon, Jaff. Next up, it's Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Alex Vankoff is a Russian living in the south of England whom we have featured. Here he is on his own channel, shooting fallow a tiny bit more successfully than Tim. It's in Russian, but you will recognise the landscape. Maybe Alex was in that next field. Pontypool Pest Control asks a big question. Do slugs work on rabbits when fired from sub-12 foot-pound air guns? The answer is assuredly yes. All the fun of the fairground simulating real driven big game hunting next, thanks to viewers. Antonius von Papen from Hamburg, who has a pal who builds these Kyla shoot shooting ranges showcased here. So deer enthusiasts, this is the story of the Irish elk. When giant deer roamed Eurasia dates from 2019. Here is gun writer Mike Yardley, interviewed by a shock jock on talk radio about firearms post Plymouth. Rather more practical, John Bailey reacts to our field tester film last week about how rubbish 2 2 rimfire non toxic ammo is. He agrees. Let's end on a little run of worthiness. Basque has put out these series of myth versus fact films as 
one film on YouTube all about the myths about grouse malls. Basque's film follows on from Safari Club International's Myth vs Facts campaign to educate legislators in the UK and the rest of the world about how hunting tourism conserves wildlife, as shown in this film. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs>